Hi, um, welcome to Central Iowa Our User Group online workshop. And today we are very happy to have Chris and Ali to talk about their great book, R for Marketing Research and Analytics. Uh, before we get started, I just want to remind you that you can get to the video and the slides afterwards through this website, um, scientistcafe.com. You can find the link here for both YouTube and slides. Also, since you probably from different channel, and if you have any questions, you can ask under the event page, or um, if you come here through our meetup site, you can leave a message under the meetup site. You can also send your question directly to this email address. Okay. Now I will hand it to. Chris and Adley. Hi, so before I share my slides, I'll just say hi, I'm Chris Chapman and I'm one of the two authors of R for Marketing Research and Analytics. Should I say hello? Uh, yeah, Allie. I'm Allie mcdonald fight and I'm the other author of R for Marketing Research and Analytics. All right, and we're so happy to be with you uh, this evening and to take your questions at the end and we'll um, you know, talk through slides. It'll take us likely 45 to 60 minutes, and then we should have plenty of time. And so I will start the uh, slide share here if I'm able to. All right, is that coming through okay, Way? Yes. Great. So I'll talk uh, a bit. So I, I work at Google. I'm what's called a quantitative user experience researcher, uh, which is a somewhat unique role. There are not uh, many of us at Google and, and not many in the industry beyond Google. But I thought I would explain a bit about that background, which then will help explain uh, some of the contents of the book. Um, so this is a role, if you've seen Drew Conway's data scientist Venn diagram, which I highly recommend, and you can Google that. Um, you know, he, he talks about different skills that overlap uh, for uh, for a data scientist, and similarly for a UX research, we have multiple skills. So we have to have statistics and encoding which would be difficult for data mining and for data scientists. And then we add the behavioral research aspect. You have echo for your sound. Do you have multiple microphones on? Let me see. Um, OK, now it, it seems better. Seems better. Yeah, OK. OK. Um, OK, if, if needed, uh, let me know, and I can try to mute the computer, although that would have the problem that I wouldn't hear you then. So, um, <clears throat> OK. so so. In addition to the typical data scientist skills, in the quant UX research we add behavioral research, which in my case comes from background in academic psychology, um, but for other people that might be ethnography, marketing research, um, anthropology, um, so a number of uh, human computer interaction, so different sources. And bringing all that together lets us understand users in depth. Uh, in both a qualitative way to help form hypotheses and then to bring the, the data science skills in uh, to analyze and understand the data. So a lot of overlap by bringing in both the behavioral and the quantitative side, a lot of overlap with marketing uh, research. So now I'll turn it to Ellie to talk about her work. Sure. So, so students often ask me the question, you know, what do you do? And um, so I, I try to have a simple answer to that question. Um, so the answer is there in the red letters on the left. I develop statistical models, uh, mostly to understand customers. Uh, my focus has always been on companies and what companies are going to do, um, and my goal is to help them make better decisions, uh, and I also teach those methods to others. So uh, I started my career at General Motors uh, in 1998. And I was really focused for a number of years on choice modeling, um, which we're going to talk about a little bit today. So the customers I was focused on were potential vehicle buyers. I was really focused on what GM could do. And I was actually focused on a specific type of decision, which is how to design vehicles. Um, 
and I did a little bit of teaching uh, when I was at GM to, to fellow colleagues. Um, since then, I've kind of broadened out, and I, I work on a lot of different problems uh, besides choice modeling, and most recently, I've been really interested in um, what are called ad stock models and also experimental methods to understand how customers typically of companies that are like retailers like Walmart or um, Pottery Barn or a company like that, how they design catalogs and email mailings. Um, and then I also teach those methods. I do a lot of work with um, company partners and I work with the Wharton Customer Analytics Initiative which is a research center at Wharton that partners with companies um, to develop new statistical methods. So uh, that's a little bit about what I do. And actually, uh, this timeline actually does represent um, kind of, uh, you know, I started at GM in 1998, and somewhere around 2010, I got my PhD and became a professor, and I started using R in 2004. Uh, so I guess I've been using R for 12 years now, which seems like a long time. <laughs> All right, Chris. Great. Yeah, so, so a few observations about uh, the state of uh, quantitative methods in, in marketing research specifically. So one is that, you know, depth in uh, statistics, so knowledge of uh, uh, whether it's uh, classification, whether it is uh, choice modeling and response, uh, whether it's uh, experimental design for A-B testing, there's a lot of depth that's needed uh, to do the research correctly. Uh, and simply to have the expertise needed to understand the pitfalls and interpret models uh, correctly. But additionally, uh, we find that people need statistics breadth. So simply being an expert in any one method is not enough in, in any marketing department or, or most companies today. Instead, you've got to be able to select from many methods and, and develop customer insight rapidly in order to impact the businesses. And, and I found over my career that that's, if anything, that's just speeding up more and more. So a couple of implications from this is that, you know, there are too many uh, statistical methods and, and applications to expect any analyst to be an expert in everything. Um, and because analysts are not experts in everything, they often end up recreating the wheel. So someone who does not know about pricing research for example, or brand research, may get a question saying, tell us about customer expectations around the price or their perception of our brand. And because they're not experts, they'll make up a new method uh, sometimes to, uh, to do that research, and it will be you know, suboptimal to do that. In the literature to date, there have not been many references in quantitative marketing that describe the breadth of methods uh, in a way that are accessible for general researchers and statisticians. So for folks who want to go out there and learn, how do I get started with brand research? How do I get started with satisfaction? How do I get started with choice modeling? Um, there's a lot of depth literature, but not a lot of breadth. So when Ellie and I started on this book, one of the things we wanted to do was to try to provide that sort of breadth uh, exposure uh, to highlight a number of, of these methods while maintaining enough technical depth to get people off to a very credible and technically accurate start. So that led us to, uh, to the book, R for Marketing Research and Analytics. And uh, this slide outlines uh, you know, some of the basic chapters here. And, and it's divided into, into two general sections. Uh, one section is really basic uh, models, first focusing on the mechanics of R. So the first three chapters, simply learning to do things like create variables and load data sets and, and do very simple uh, kinds of data uh, munging. Uh, and then as, after that, we talk about very simple statistical models such as descriptive statistics um, and then linear models. Then the second half of the book goes through a number of relatively advanced and somewhat specialized topics, but that we try to approach uh, in a way that anyone who is um, you know, generally versed in statistics or in data science uh, could read the chapter and understand them. So we leave out most of the math. Uh, we provide practical examples that use R code. Um, and so some of the uses for those that we talk about, there's factor analysis in, in Chapter 8, which is commonly used in marketing applications to assess a brand 
or product positioning to get strategic insight. So where is my brand relative to others? If I give a long survey, what are the uh, perceptual aspects that are driving uh, consumers' responses to the survey? In the next chapter, we then uh, talk about hierarchical linear models, which let us move the statistical models from an aggregate level, talking about an entire sample or an entire population, and move it to understanding the individual level or groups within the population. And a group may be one person, or it may be a group by state or region or gender, whatever it might be. So hierarchical models let us bring that analysis to a, a more actionable and targetable level. Uh, the next chapter on uh, uh, confirmatory factor analysis and structural equation models lets us work with data where there are many, many related variables. So if we have a customer survey, for example, there may be dozens or hundreds of questions that we're asking, and we assume that those responses are all related to one another in, in complex ways. Uh, these sorts of models let us reduce the data and uh, analyze how the underlying uh, latent variables may be related to one another. I'll, we'll show an example of this uh, momentarily. Um, we talk about clustering and classification, which are used for targeting, for segmentation. Um, association rules, which are often used for retail optimization. So for example, looking at which products are related to which other products. If someone's buying hot dogs, what are they likely to buy with the hot dogs? There op often are some obvious answers, but oftentimes in these data sets there are some non-obvious answers of how things are related as well, and association rules allow that sort of exploration. And then finally, there are choice models that we talk about, which is historically has been a very specialized area within quantitative marketing. And choice models look at how consumers actually choose when they're presented with alternatives in the marketplace. And that gives insight into uh, the, their preference for features, how those features should be prioritized in product design, uh, how those features relate to price and willingness to pay, and then ultimately uh, how it relates to the portfolio. If someone's making multiple products, what should those products be for optimal uh, coverage of uh, consumers' needs? So each one of these chapters, you know, I. I think no one can reasonably be expected to be an expert in, in all of these things, but to have the breadth within marketing research, it's helpful to know about them. So we wanted to provide a good starting point into all of these, uh, as well as to allow folks to learn R from the beginning. So the book both teaches R from you know, the absolute basics in the first chapter, uh, as well as providing things that we think should be of interest to, you know, to even folks who are expert in R in these later chapters. So that was our goal. As I mentioned, we're going to talk about two of these today. So I'm going to talk about a survey validation and using these confirmatory uh, structural equation models in survey research. And then Ellie will talk about uh, choice models and how you can use uh, surveys and, and R uh, to estimate consumer preference. Okay. So quick introduction to structural equation models in R. So the first question is, well, what are they? So if we consider a survey that asks about satisfaction with a shopping experience, uh, which a retailer might do, so you might imagine that you go and you buy a new car, perhaps. And you can get a follow-up uh, questionnaire about this. And it will ask a number of items. And it will probably ask something like, how satisfied are you with your purchase, with, with the car that you bought? How satisfied are you with the salesperson uh, that you interacted with? And then uh, oftentimes they'll ask, what's your likelihood to recommend? Would you recommend this car to someone else? Would you recommend your salesperson to someone else? And the business will want to know how these things are related. So for example, if you're more satisfied, how are you therefore more likely to recommend? Will there be positive word of mouth of satisfied customers? Um, and if so, how strong is that? So for example, if the satisfied customers are very likely to recommend, then it might be a good idea to target them in future campaigns uh, to follow up with them and ask them to send referrals. But if their likelihood to recommend is quite low based on satisfaction, then you might not target them in that way. 
depending on. So knowing the relationship of satisfaction to recommendation could be important to know for a business uh, uh, decision. However, there's a problem in the statistical models, which is that on a survey like this, everything will be highly correlated, typically. So people who are give a high rating for satisfaction with the product also rate the salesperson highly. They'll also tend to uh, give high scores for recommendation for both the product and the salesperson, and you'll get back correlation matrices that look uh, often something like this. And there's uh, a common joke is that everything correlates with everything 0.3. Depending on your domain, sometimes it's 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. But this sort of general, uh, what uh, the psychologist Paul Meal called the crud factor, um, shows up in this sort of survey research all the time. And so looking at this, we'll say, well, what is the relationship between satisfaction and recommendation? Maybe in the 0.2 range? It's hard to tell. So, but if we conceive of satisfaction as an underlying latent construct, if, so if we think, for example, that a customer has some satisfaction uh, score in a general way in their head, that they're perhaps not able to access, but that their overall satisfaction it leads to uh, their expression of satisfaction with the product and satisfaction with the salesperson. And they have a likelihood to recommend, which leads to their ratings for recommending the product, recommending the salesperson, and so forth. Then we could think about satisfaction and, re and likelihood to recommend as these kind of latent constructs that we can't directly observe. We observe a number of variables, each one of which is affected by them, but we don't observe the underlying latent constructs themselves, their, uh, uh, their, their hypotheses about what could be going on. So what structural equation modeling does is to allow us to estimate this model. So things that are latent here are expressed as circles that we don't observe, but we hypothesize are uh, underlying the data. And then the things in, in the boxes are the data points that we might observe that are the, the manifest expressions of those underlying variables. So this is a general idea in confirmatory factor analysis where we have underlying factors that affect the ratings we observe and in a more general way, structural equation model. Um, and so this is a very simple structural equation model we show here where we think the latent satisfaction drives the variables we observe on the left. It also is related to likelihood to recommend uh, on the right, and then likelihood to recommend in turn affects the survey variables that we observe. But instead of the correlation matrix that we saw previously, which just tells how the different data points relate to each other, a structural equation model addresses the business question directly and estimates all of the arrows that you see here, in particular the arrow in the middle, which is how is satisfaction related to recommendation. So it estimates that very directly and gives um, a, oftentimes a very clear answer to that sort of question. So let's talk about how to do this in R. So the first thing in R, of course, is you load the data and set up the model. And here we use a data set that you're welcome to use. It's on our book's website. Uh, and we have a link to that later. And it's one we use in the book. Um, so we read the data in, and in this case, the data looks uh, like you see here. We have the product satisfaction, salesperson satisfaction. We have a consumer segment that I'm not going to talk about in, in this talk, um, but it's in the book. Uh, and then we have the likelihood to recommend variables, and people have rated this on a seven-point scale. This is uh, uh, simulated data on a seven-point Likert-type scale uh, for their likelihood and their satisfaction. So we read the data into R. Then we set up, we define this uh, model that expresses the latent variables. And there's a very simple syntax for this with the Levan package in R. And the syntax basically here, it's a text string. But it says that satisfaction is manifested as these two sat variables. Uh, likely to recommend is manifest as these two recommendation variables. And then finally, um, you know, recommendation is, uh, uh, is correlated with satisfaction. So that's the model which expresses, you know, uh, the, the graph that you see on the right-hand side. 
Given that, in our um, model, we estimate it uh, using the Levan package by calling a confirmatory factor analysis for the satisfaction model, which is simply the string that you see above that defines the model, and for the given data set. So the CFA uh, function will go out and find the SAT data that we loaded previously, match it up to the variable names uh, that are shown in the string defining the model, and then the other things in the model that are not defined uh, in the data set are the latent variables. So it, it goes and parses all that. And like most things in R, then what we do is we inspect uh, that fit object to say, okay, you fit it, how good was the fit? And for a structural equation model, uh, you get back a lot of information in this, but there are two things that I'd highlight here. One is uh, you get some fit indices, such as the comparative fit index, which says how well does this model fit the data. Um, in this case, it fits it uh, nearly perfectly um, in the CFI um, after accounting for noise. Um, and then it gives the estimates for the parameters of interest. So in this case, the uh, relationship between recommendation and satisfaction, uh, the key uh, estimate here is 0.758, which means that, you know, it's a very strong correlation between them. So it's 0.76. Chris? Or, yes. This is Ellie. I have a quick question for yeah. you. So for the, uh, it's a question about how you set up the input. Mm -hmm. So, um, is there a reason that SAT and REC are in all capital letters? Is that important? Or how does it figure out which variables are going to be the latent variables, the ones that aren't observed? Yeah, so the latent variables are defined with this sort of a equals tilde uh, sort of thing. Um, hmm. And it, with that and with the fact that they don't appear in the data set, the, um, the capital letters here um, I believe are not required in the Levan syntax, I, um, but I use them uh, consistently uh, simply so that the latent variables are clearer in my code. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, okay. that's yeah. my memory. I, I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure they're not, it's not required, it's just uh, a convention. And for the two latent variables, the, the, the direction of the error doesn't mean, like, um, you just have a tutor there, so it's a relation among these two. It doesn't have a meaning of direction, right? Um, it it does have the meaning of directionality in the sense, in a conceptual sense, which is that the premise is that um, the premise here is that there is a latent construct that you can't observe, which in this case would be someone's satisfaction with with their experience. You can't observe the satisfaction directly. Um, what you can do is to ask one or more items about it and then the idea is that that psychological state basically influences the ratings that they give on those variables. So it becomes manifest as answers on the survey um, and that's what you observe. So that's why the arrows in a in this sort of model go in that direction. It's um, sort of it, it's not causal in the sense of uh, expressing you know strong causation, but it is causal in the sense that it's kind of hypothesized that the influence is flowing in that direction. Okay. Yeah. What about the arrow between SAT and REC? Yeah, so that similarly, um, so this is one you would specify. So in this case, the, the tilde here in defining the model says basically not only that they're correlated, but that it depends on. Mm -hmm. So again, it's this kind of conceptual uh, dependence, which is viewed as, um, it can be either unidirectional or bidirectional. So you could, for example, have a model in which you say simply, recommendation and satisfaction are correlated, and then you'd get a bidirectional uh, relationship. But in this case, the business uh, question said, how much does satisfaction affect likelihood to recommend? So I modeled this as a unidirectional 
uh, to match that question. And if we want to know how satisfaction related to some kind of behavior, we mm -hmm. have to collect the behavior data and we can build a similar model, right? That's right. So for example, if you had um, purchases over time, you might have satisfaction at time one with you know, uh, buying a car at time two uh, in the following year or, or something. And in that case, you would have you know, a behavioral variable such as buying the car, um, and you would draw an arrow from satisfaction to that uh, behavior. Or you might draw an arrow from satisfaction and the recommendation to that behavior. It depends on the model you want to estimate. Yeah. So typically, all kinds of behaviors you could bring in. Like you could have their answer to that recommendation question, and then did they recommend on social media if you had collected that? That's right. And so one of the uh, uh, one of the 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 papers uh, uh, that that we reference in the book has has looked at this with a number of these sort of downstream effects uh, in uh, in the space. And so that would be very common to link these and. The model shown here is one of the very simplest possible models that you know that I'm showing just for uh, you know educational purposes. But oftentimes you you might have dozens of variables here. And a nice thing about the structural equation model is that it can give a best fit um, with all of those variables. And it does two things: it allows using these latent variables to kind of uh, separate the variable space and, uh, and, and constrain uh, some of the correlations and some of the estimated noise um, and to relate those latent variables to one another. Um, and it also estimates all the relationships uh, with the best estimate while removing the noise. And that's one thing that makes a factor analytic approach, for example, different than a principal components approach. Factor analysis tries to estimate what's going on sort of under the hood, you know, while leaving out the error estimate. So, great. Um, yeah, so the other things we see in the results, so we see this estimated uh, coefficient, the 0.76, and then we see uh, standard error and then a typical sort of, uh, um, you know, F score, effect size kind of score here, and then a p-value uh, out to the end. If we plot this, so we can tell we've got this uh, uh, fit that we estimated. We've got a fit object, sat.fit, from the previous slide. Uh, we can simply uh, tell this library SEM plot to plot that, um, and we get this sort of diagram. And what we're seeing here is that estimated relationship in the middle, the 0.76. We're seeing how much each uh, item uh, basically is, is influenced by the estimated latent variable. So for example, if satisfaction goes up by one unit, we see that the satisfaction with the salesperson is estimated to go up by 1.07 units. Um, and uh, so we're seeing the model here in, in that context. We're also seeing an estimate of uh, the kind of reliability or the error of the individual items. Um, a cleaner plot way to do this, but it requires more work, is to use a diagrammer package for folks out there who need to do any sort of uh, you know charts of this kind, whether they're structural models or flow charts or uh, whatever. Uh, diagrammers is uh, makes very nice output as you see here, so much cleaner, easier to read. Um, a problem right now is that many packages do not produce diagrammer friendly output, um, so you have to you know, do it manually as I show here, but it's not too complex if you find an example. Um, so I'm not going to go through the code, but just wanted to highlight that. This is not in your book, right? This is not in the book, so no, this is... This is the <laughs> maybe, maybe in version two, so... Okay. Yeah. I would really like it if uh, if anyone out there happens to be listening who's involved in any of these packages in any way, um, if your package makes a plot that has any sort of uh, uh, you know linking together of, of, of boxes and this sort of thing, uh, produce this diagram or output. It's you know would be not too difficult to produce programmatically. Um, it'd be nice to have that in, in more packages. Um, so the complete model that we estimated here, just to kind of put it all together, 
Um, you see, it's it's really only six lines of R code to do this. You you define the model um, here. You then estimate it using the Levan library. Uh, you look at it to find out your coefficients, and you probably want to plot it. Um, and so it's uh, conceptually, it's it's uh, incredibly powerful to do this kind of latent variable modeling and to estimate. Uh, unobserved relationships in the presence of error and highly correlated data. So that's an incredibly powerful thing to do for many business problems. Uh, and uh, sorting through the jargon and the literature out there to figure out how to do it uh, is a complex process. So we wanted to boil it down and make it more approachable. And when you do that, you see that it's uh, not really that complex. There. We have a lot of pointers in the book to learning more so that you don't uh, you know, run into, into problems in doing it, but, um, but we think it's approachable and, and folks should do it more than they do. So looking back at the business question, did we answer it? Remember, we wanted to know how is satisfaction related to recommending. Um, we found the answer is it goes up 0.76 units uh, for each unit of, of uh, satisfaction on this seven point scale. Um, so that's a very strong relationship, and that would say if we wanted to do something like target satisfied users in order to try to get them to recommend, um, it's quite likely we'd have a positive uh, kind of business impact from doing that. And I'd point out that this um, core, uh, effect here between the two latent variables is stronger than any of the correlation coefficients that we saw when we just looked at the data. So if we inspected the correlation matrix, we would have said, Satisfaction affects recommendation something like 0.2 to 0.3, which is a weak to moderate that kind of correlation. Uh, but in fact, the latent variables, after we take out the error and look at the combined uh, weight of, of put it, pooling the variables together, is much, much stronger than that. So this is a much stronger business answer and uh, would uh, support a, a uh, a lot more effort into uh, into this sort of targeting and campaigning. So with that, I'm going to turn it over. Actually, I'd take any other questions, I guess, and then turn it over to Ellie for choice modeling. While we wait for questions, Chris, I'll just say that um, I, have, I work with lots of colleagues who do a lot of this kind of survey research and want to fit SEM models. Uh, and there's a lot of very specialized tools for fitting SE, software tools, I mean, just for fitting SEM tools. And um, yes. they always ask me, can you do SEM in R? And I, I'm always <laughs> able to say, yes, there's a chapter in the book on how to do that. And they're, they're always very surprised because they've always thought of SEM as something that they needed to get a very special tool for. That's right, yeah. Two of the most popular tools for SEM are Amos, which is part of the SPSS suite, and, and M+, which is a standalone um, SEM specialized package. Um, the tools in R are, I would say, are, you know, there are certain things that could be done, you know, in M plus, for example, that would be very difficult to do in the various R, R SEM packages. But that's those are very specialized niches uh, for SEM research, and which are important in some fields like repeated measures of, uh, you know, in, in, in some areas. But in my experience, it don't occur much in marketing. The R packages are quite powerful, um, and there's a choice of them. Levan's, I think, particularly easy to use. OpenMX is, uh, um, you know, is, is powerful and, and might uh, align more with some of the, uh, the folks who are used to the other packages. But there are a number of options. I have a question here. Uh, what if you can't find any relationship? Here you can find strong relationship, but what if you can't find relationship? Does that mean you're going to find and try another structure? Or how, how do you know why you can't find relationship? Yeah, so in... Um, I um, firmly advocate having this be a theory-driven sort of approach. So, so typically... In the process, there's a preliminary step, which I haven't shown here, which would be to do some exploratory factor analysis to find out 
whether you believe whether the items appear to have a latent relationship to an underlying factor. So the exploratory work says, are there latent factors under there? And commonly in exploratory factor analysis, what you would do is start with a large number of items, find the ones that, so we might ask satisfaction about, let's say, 15 different aspects of their experience. And then we might find the satisfaction, in fact, there are only a few items that have a very strong relationship and the others appear not to. We would iterate on the survey, keep the items that have a strong relationship to the underlying factor and probably discard the others or replace them. And so there's some preliminary work in getting the data to sort of believe that you are assessing latent variables in a good way. Um, and we talk about that in, in uh, the chapter on exploratory factor analysis. Um, what I, given that, you should then have a pretty strong theory about how they relate. And I advocate uh, fitting, you know, the model you believe in and then one or two alternative models and to show that the model you believe in is better than the alternatives. What I sometimes see um, in, uh, uh, you know, in sometimes in papers and in the field, and I strongly disrecommend, is to do model hunting. Uh, and there is even software that will do this, where you can say, take all of these, find the latent variables that make sense of it and that have the strong relationship. Um, that's fishing for correlations that are not theory-driven, and I, um, you know, I disrecommend that if it's uh, avoidable at all. So. To be, to, I've been involved in a few projects, Chris, where um, these things have kind of spun out of control where uh, managers start recommending alternative models, one model after another, and so the analyst team is just fitting models, fitting models, fitting models. You end up with a 200-page report describing <laughs> 50 different models, and you don't really get to the business outcome. Yes. Uh, but when, you have, when you do have sort of a strong theory about how the things ought to be related, um, it works beautifully. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would just try to, yeah, I would say avoid being in that situation and, um, you know, so that's you where... say organizationally, if you, like, if you're actually dealing with managers, if you fit the one you believe in and then a couple others, that kind of closes down this conversation about the, the thousands of other models you could have chosen. I hope so, yes. <laughs> Good. <laughs> and also uh, another one, can we use the model on transactional data, not market research data, like to figure out different relation among different discounts, they are they have similar pattern, they are highly correlated. Um, yes, so, so absolutely. So if you have basically the structural equation model could be used uh, any time that you have you know, a bunch of variables that have a number of paths that you think connect, where the paths just mean relationships among them. Um, they don't even have to have latent variables in particular, although that would be the most common thing, is if you believe, for example, in a transactional day, there may be something like, um, oh, for groceries, there may be, you know, latent propensity to buy milk or something. So you could, you know, construct or, you know, a latent variable that, that you believe is manifest as a number of uh, a different observed data points, although it's not required. But the structural model could certainly be used in that. In a transactional um, a situation, you might want to look at a, uh, at a repeated measures or some sort of time series, a kind of structural model, which is a more complex a model to fit. But, um, you know, the, the specialized software, in particular OpenMX, um, you know, can handle um, that sort of thing. So that's a specialized area um, if it's a time series and repeated measures, um, but in general applying it to transactional data, absolutely. Um, one issue might be uh, the size of the data sets, um, you know, to think about, um, you know, to what extent it would make sense to, uh, to downsample or somehow reduce your data. If you try to fit a structural equation model to millions of data points, um, I, I think it'd be tough. I've never tried it, but I, I think uh, you'd be stretching the, uh, you know, the the model, uh, the estimation engine. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. 
Okay. Okay. I'll turn it Ready? over to Ellen. Great. All right. So um, you can go to the next slide, Chris. Oh. Oh, I have to fix it. It's showing me. We. So um, before I get into um, what choice modeling is, um, I want to jump in and kind of describe uh, something that I think is really bad marketing research practice, but pretty common. Um, so if you are designing a new car and you're trying to figure out, um, should I say, for instance, I'm trying to figure out, I'm building a minivan, and I'm trying to figure out how many seats should the minivan have versus how much room should it have for suitcases and other cargo. And, uh, you know, the engineering challenge there is if you make more seats, there's less room um, for the cargo and vice versa, unless you want to make the car bigger, and if you make the car bigger, then it has worse fuel economy and a bunch of other bad things. Um, so engineers are constantly faced with this question of, uh, you know, what is most important to our customers? Do they care more about seating capacity or more about cargo room? Um, and the, a common survey approach to this is to just give people these seven-point Likert scales uh, where they rate the importance of seating capacity, cargo room, engine type, and price. Um, and there's a couple of problems with this. Do you want to go to the next slide, Chris? The biggest problem with this is that, um, say we got back data, this is fictional data, so I don't know if this really represents any customers, um, but we just compute the average rating for each of these things. Um, it really isn't meaningful to an engineer, so I can say that the, the engine type gets a rating of 5.2 and the seating get, type gets a, a rating of 5.5, but I really don't know what that means. Like, should I have seven seats and um, a, a really crappy engine, or should I use eight, you know, eight, six seats and a better engine? It's where I should exactly make those trade offs is just unclear from this data. Um, the other issue is that uh, consumers will often just straight line down the very important. So they'll just say everything is very important. So you get customers who tell you that everything you're asking me about is very important, and the engineer um, is left scratching her head going, well, I can't, I can't do everything. That's not physically possible, and this data doesn't help me figure out um, kind of where in the design space I should be. Um, and what businesses really want to know, you know, what the engineer is really asking herself is how many people would buy our product if we made it have seven seats and we gave it, um, you know, a, a gas conventional engine that's not particularly desirable. What, what exactly would happen? How many people would buy? Um, and so what choice modeling allows you to do, and you can go to the next slide, Chris, um, what choice modeling allows you to do is actually give respondents that choice task. So um, this is an example of a choice modeling question. So which of the following minivans would you buy? Um, assume all three minivans are identical other than the features listed below. So you're considering three minivans that are the same brand and color and all, all the usual things. But which of those three is most desirable to you? Um, and you can see that this customer has um, checked off that she likes option three best, um, which has a gas engine and is $30,000 and so forth. Um, and consumers can give very meaningful answers to these questions. Um, the thing is we have to use a model to kind of back out how the features are affecting their choices. Um, so we're going to do something like regression, but it's not, it's not quite regression, um, to figure out how those features relate to the choices. So here's the model that we're going to use. Um, it's called the multinomial logit model. It's also called the conditional logit model. And that's one of the things that makes reading, if you read some of the technical papers in this area, it can be very confusing because um, engineers use these models, uh, marketing people use these models, economists use these models, and people who work in transportation use these models, and they all have different ways of talking about them. Um, 
And so with the book, we were trying to make an entry point into using these tools that would be accessible to people who are working in marketing. Um, all right, so what we're going to try to do is estimate what we call utility, which is really just um, a parameter for each feature that tells us how important that feature is to the respondent. So um, we're going to say that the total utility of the product uh, for respondent I is this eta IJ. And then if we sum up the exponential of all those utilities, that's going to be the total utility of all the products that you're considering buying, which would be the three products we gave you in the choice question. Um, then we're going to say that your likelihood to choose to check the box for one of those items follows this equation here where we have the, the exponential of eta ij over the sum of the exponential of eta ij's, and it's, it's a little bit... Um, it, that sum of there is over k. Um, but that formula it looks really complicated, but it turns out it's the perfect thing for doing this. If you sum up the probabilities, they're going to add up to 1, which is a nice feature. You have to pick one of them so that it's good if the probabilities add up to 1. So that's essentially the equation that we're going to posit. And so we're going to um, estimate that model just the way we would estimate a regression model um, and figure out what are those parameters on the features. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So here, how do we actually do that? Um, well, first we have to get some data. So I'm going to load a data file here. Um, same thing we did before. I'm loading this as a, it's a synthetic data set. It's from the book website. Um, I have to do a little bit of work to make sure that the variables read incorrectly. I don't know how much um, all of you have used the read.csv function, but one of the maddening things about it is that sometimes it will read in a variable in a way that you, you didn't intend. So this column classes option helps you clean that up so that it reads it in um, the way you want it, which in this case I want the seat variable and the price variable to be treated as factors, even though they're numbers. Um, so that's in this CBC data frame. Um, so I'm going to read that into that. And then if you do the head of the CBC data frame, you can see the first couple of rows there. Um, and the data is organized in kind of a way you might ex not expect. So let me walk you into it. There are three, the first three lines represent the question that I have depicted there on the slide. Um, so usually one row equals one observation, but in this case three rows is one observation um, because there's three different products. So uh, that first question was answered by respondent one, it's question number one, and the three rows give you alternatives one, two, and three, and you can see that they, the variables there represent uh, the question as it's, as it's described in that picture. Um, and then the choice we'll just have in this uh, column of zeros and ones. Um, and that's all I'll say about that, except that uh, every single choice modeling package handles the f data formatting in a slightly different way. Uh, so you have to be really careful and, and read the documentation closely and make sure that you're setting up the data just right. Um, in fact, I probably, when, when we wrote the book, I probably fussed with this for a few hours to make sure I had everything exactly um, how the package wants the data to be. Um, but it is, uh, I, I promise you that. And so if we go to the next slide and actually run the model, um, the, the library we're going to use is called mlogit. There's actually, just like with SEM, um, there's a couple of different packages that do choice models. Um, MLogit is one that, that I, I, I prefer. Um, it's got a few things I don't like about it, but, but for the most part, it's pretty easy to use. And so you can see the call there. Um, the first call, we're going to uh, put the data in a special format that is the MLogit data format. So we're going to create a new data object, CBC MLogit, and um, we create that by using this MLogit data function where we pass our data um, into MLogit data and tell it a few other things about the data. Um, so we're telling it, uh, well, I won't go through all that. Um, you, can, you can read about it in the book, I guess. Uh, so um, once we have that MLogit data object, we're ready to go, and you can see that the call looks very much like call to LM or any other regression function. 
in R, and that's one of the reasons I really like the mlogit package. So um, we're going to take the mlogit function, and we're going to define a model, a choice model now, where the choice is a function of the seating, the cargo capacity, the engine, and the price. Um, I have taken the intercept out here, um, and we talk about in the book what that, that means. Basically, I'm just saying that there's no... Um, differential shift between the middle, the right, and the left, that people don't particularly choose ones on the right. Um, so that's the model, uh, and I pass it this CBC mlogit data object. It has to be in that special mlogit format, not in a regular data frame. Um, but And do that, and then if I do a summary of that model, I get something that looks very much like um, a regression output. So you can see um, there's two, there's actually three levels of seating, six, seven, and eight, and these parameters show you the utility of six seats and eight seats relative to six, and they're negative, which means that people actually prefer six seats over seven or eight, uh, and then there's a standard error and a t-value and a p-value, just like you would have in any other regression output table. Um, I won't go through the interpretation of all the other parameters. Um, there's one fancy thing about this model that I didn't tell you. Um, this mlogit model that we're uh, running here actually assumes that each person has his or her own utilities, uh, and then those these reported here are the averages across the population. So this wouldn't every user wouldn't have these utilities, but on average across the population people tend to prefer six seats over seven or eight. I'm sure there are people in the data set that actually do prefer eight seats, uh, maybe because they have six children or something and they really they really need eight seats. Um, okay. Uh, we, I, there's a note here at the bottom. Um, one of the alternative uh, tools for this um, is Bayes M, which actually, so little bit of behind the scenes, mlogit uses classical estimation methods and Bayes M uses Bayesian estimation methods. Um, anyway, I, I picked mlogit because I think it's a little bit easier to use, but if you really want to be Bayesian, you can, you can fit the same model with Bayes M, and that package has just been redesigned um, and is apparently much, much faster than it used to be, uh, and highly recommend you take a look at that if, if choice models become uh, a big part of your analyst's work. Um, we can go to the next slide. And I'd say, and we discussed both of those approaches. In this. Yes, both both are in there, so you can take a look at both of those. Does All Bayesian right. work better? What does, was that? Does Bayesian model work better? I you should get very similar results with both methods, unless your data is really doesn't support the model you're trying to estimate. You know when you're doing a regression and you've got multicollinearity and things become unstable? Um, when that happens, one of these methods might work better than the other, but other than that case, in for, for any normal data set, both methods should give you very similar answers. Actually, Chris, would you go back a slide? Yeah. So, um, the, this table is the table that I usually look at, but I've been looking at choice models for a long, long time, um, and I have tried to show this table to engineers, and they never get it. So I recommend you never, ever show this table to an engineer. You have to understand a lot of things, like about how factors get coded in regression and how choice models work in order to fully understand um, these, these parameter coefficients. But... Uh, as Chris did with the SEM, you know, both of us in our own practice like to make sure we get to the point uh, where we can show a decision maker something that will help them make a decision. And I, you know, I've just found that this table does not help anyone make decisions. So going back to what's the question they originally asked? They asked if we put a particular product in the market, um, what will the share be for that product? Um, so on this slide here, um, let's just start with the output at the bottom. Um, what I've done is I have written a little function that will predict share for a set of products. So imagine you have the products that are in this table at the bottom. Product, the first product there, um, 
is a seven-seat uh, minivan with two feet cargo capacity, a hybrid engine, and a price of thirty. And the second one is a six-seat, two feet gas, two foot cargo gas engine at a price of thirty, and so forth. So you can imagine these are like the six most popular minivans in the market. Um, and you're the company that's working on designing the first product there, the seven-seat, two-foot hybrid, $30,000 minivan. Um, and you can use this share prediction um, tool to play around, well, what if I made this seat six seats? We know that on average from the last table, six seats are more preferred. Could I get my market share up to 50% or 55%? Um, so it'll, it'll give you that share prediction. Um, and so I've actually been in meetings where I'll sit with engineers. Uh, we actually go out to the competitive intelligence unit. I'm talking about my, my days at GM. We would go out to the competitive intelligence unit and they would tell us what all the competitor products looked like. We'd put those into this tool along with um, you know, the, the design that the engineers have in mind, and then we, we start playing around with that and say, well, what if this, what if that? Um, and this kind of what if tool can be really powerful for engineers. You know, the engineer can say, wow, if I could double the share of my product, all of a sudden my production costs are going to go way down. Um, so, yes, I really do want to invest in getting that hybrid engine because it looks like that's going to be really popular. And it's all, all of this analysis is based on what people say in, um, in the survey that we ask them. So, and in my experience, um, people are pretty good at answering these surveys. The only time, it, you know, if you ask someone about what kind of minivan they want, they usually answer those questions pretty carefully and pretty honestly. Um, the only exception to that I've seen is when you, if you do a conjoint for something that people dream about, like a vacation or a sports car or something that people like to fantasize about, they will not pick things that they might pick in the real world. But for for ordinary things, I know Chris has done this a lot with like computer peripherals, and I've done it with everything from uh, package salad. Um, I was working on one this morning that I'm working on with a physician that's um, people choosing different kinds of treatment for melanoma. Um, and we seem to be getting, you know, reasonable results that uh, the physician at least thinks are pretty consistent with what his, um, what his patients are asking for. So, um, Anyway, this, this is a pretty useful tool. Um, in the book, we show a little bit more of how to make graphs uh, that, you, that you might actually show to a decision maker. Um, but I found just sitting down with the simulator tool that predicts the shares and just letting the engineer play with it um, herself really, really can be very effective at, at kind of driving the organization to figuring out what features do we want to include in our product. Um, and it avoids the Homer Simpson card. You know about, has, have you all seen the episode of The Simpsons where they ask Homer to design a car and he puts all these crazy features on it and the car costs a million dollars and nobody buys it? Um, you know, that's a very tempting thing in the product design process. The engineers want to put all the new exciting features on it. And this is a good way of putting those features in front of consumers um, and asking them what would they choose if these were, were the options that they had. Um, and if I don't know if, how many of you have written um, functions in R, uh, but if you go through the code there at the top of the screen, that'll give you a chance to see, you know, how to write a basic function in R uh, and then call that function a few a uh, few lines down. But I won't go through the the details of that. Um, so that's everything I had on choice models. I guess we should take questions on choice models. Oh. Um, yeah, you know, Chris and I have both done a lot of this work in you know, at real companies, so if you're interested in applying it, um, you probably have two very good people to ask questions of. Yeah, a couple of things I'd, I'd point out here. Chris, uh, w one is that another common term, which I, I just realized does not appear in this presentation, is conjoint analysis. So that's the uh, exactly the same as, as what we're talking about here. Um, and, and after doing, uh, I, I don't even know, well over a hundred of these sorts of uh, projects that I've been involved with in the past decade, I still find that choice modeling is is absolutely astonishing in the amount of insight uh, and uh, the the kind of directional validity 
uh, when it's done well versus what you can expect in in well-defined markets, as as Ellie said. So I I find it to be um, just an incredibly valuable uh, tool. Yeah. And, you hinted, Chris, that this probably wouldn't work very well for uh, products that customers aren't even familiar enough. Like if you were to go back 20 years and ask people about their preferences for tablet computers, it might be pretty pretty hard for them to imagine. But for any market that consumers are pretty familiar with what, you know, what different types of products there are, um, it just works really well. I forgot to mention that uh, um, you don't have to get the data from a survey. If you have some data where customers have um, made a choice, like you know that they've come in the store and there were four different options on the shelf and they picked one of those options, um, if you have transactional data like this, this works very nicely to figure out what are the, the features in market that are driving consumer choice. Um, so that, that's another application of this that often used in, um, with grocery store products because it's pretty easy to get that transaction data. It's harder with something like cars because it's really hard to figure out what are the cars that someone was choosing from when they made a choice. Do we have any questions? Yeah. Is there any requirement on the questionnaire, how to ask a question? What if you ask someone how likely they're going to buy, not zero one? For each choice, how so, likely they're um, going to buy? There's a, I, I don't recommend that because um, it's just easier for respondents to pick the one they like best. But there actually is a whole form of conjoint where you just give them one profile at a time and you ask them to say how likely they would be to buy that profile. And then you can analyze that with linear regression. So you don't need to use um, the mLogit package or, or a choice model. You can actually analyze that with linear regression. And that's what people did in the 70s um, when choice modeling software wasn't readily available. But by the 90s, um, pretty much everyone who does these kinds of surveys regularly had switched over to the choice framework, um, mostly because respondents like it. It's easier to, they go, you're used to going to the store and picking a product and putting it in your cart. It's a little odd to have someone say, how, you know, here's a product, do you like it or not? Here's another product, do you like it or not? That gets a little um, more tedious for the customer. Yeah, I sometimes I agree. We talk about the um, uh, the kind of ratings based likelihood in in uh, in the book. In I think it's chapter nine when we introduced conjoint uh, mm -hmm. models. But I agree with Ellie. One, there are a few places where I've seen ratings based approaches used. Um, sometimes, for example, to do volumetric type estimates of asking them how much would they, for example, in, in pharmaceuticals, how much would a physician prescribe this or that, or something where they want a scalar response uh, rather than a choice. But um, but choice modeling is is generally much easier, much more powerful, and um, and really, the, the, you know, what almost all of these sorts of surveys use now. And do you also get feedback from the sales later, like if you have a decision and you try to get feedback from this later? So that's a good question. Um, at, I can tell you what we did at General Motors. Um, we never did that. Um, and we never actually would tell people that this is the market share. We actually were very careful and would always call it um, preference share or clinic share, because clinic is, for some reason, GM uses the word clinic to mean survey. Um, so you could call it survey share or something like that so that people, the engineers understood this was from a survey, um, and so it might not um, accurately reflect everything that customers would do in the real market. Um, you can do things to try to make them match real shares better. Uh, I actually wrote my dissertation on um, actually putting some survey data together with some transaction data to try to get something that would be closer uh, to what would happen in the real market, or at least identify if there's differences between what's going on in the survey and what's going on in the market. Um, but I think like with all survey research, it's better to just tell decision makers that it's a survey um, 
and it might not perfectly reflect the real world, but it, you know, getting a model that perfectly predicts share in the real world is a, a tricky proposition. Yeah, the real world's affected by many other things such as distribution and, you know, and, and advertising and so forth. But I have often compared uh, conjoint predictions um, or, you know, preferences to, to what the later uh, product share is. And um, my experience has been, and there's, you can Google, a, a, in fact, a paper that I, I wrote that, that presented one of these using ACBC, would be a kind of keyword, adaptive choice-based conjoint. But my, um, and in that paper it was predicted the market very closely. In general, I agree strongly to kind of stay away from that and to talk about preference. But my experience has been that as you start to do more and more studies within a space and you start to learn which attributes really drive preference, and if the space is mature, then over time you're, uh, the preference share should look more like the market share in that space, but there are many other uncaptured variables. Yeah, the, the reason for the difference in our answers, Chris, might be that I worked a lot with cars, and cars are heavily distribution constrained. Mm -hmm. they're, they're manufacturing constrained, actually. You can't make that many, even if your car is very popular, you won't be able to make that many, mm -hmm. um, and so you'll often see market shares be very different than what consumers really want. Yeah, but we strong. I strongly agree on but, but not for reporting it as student, market share. Reporting, yeah, re reporting yeah, it sorry. as preference. So yeah. Do you have a recommended number of choices? Here we have three, and I I guess you can't have too many. They will get. Yeah, that's a better. really good question. Um, the more choice, there's a theoretical, kind of a theoretical statistical answer to that, which is that the more choices, the more alternatives you put on the screen, the more informative the question is, sort of from a statistical point of view. Uh, but from a practical point of view, the more things you put on the screen, the more things the respondent has to read, and it becomes very tedious for the respondent. It, and then actually they get very slow. Um, so you know, the practical answer to this is you put as many options as you can kind of fit on the screen in a reasonable way that people can easily read and, and make a choice. I think in practice the typical is 3 to 10, somewhere in that range. Just And it really, like if you had an image for each of the options, then that's going to take up more screen space. And, and so um, you're really just limited by that the screen space and what's a reasonable amount for people to read. I know there's some papers on that, um, but yeah. a couple things I point one is in in any survey of this kind, it's extremely important I think uh, to pre-test it with a small number of people, like even if it's just four or five people that you can test in person uh, from your target uh, population, um, so that you can basically determine. You know, does the survey make sense to them, and are they able to do it in the way that you expect? So strongly advocate pretesting, and then in terms of learning more about you know designs and how people respond to different formats and length and that sort of thing, there's there's a conference called um, the Sawtooth Software Conference, and they're a, so a software maker in this field. But the Sawtooth Software Conference puts all of their conference proceedings online, and they have a lot of papers that talk about things like optimal number of questions and and design. Um, when you have survey question, is it necessary to check the gap between response and their real behavior? Like if they if they say they're going to recommend one product, very likely, but we don't know if in the end they will really do that. So one of the things I forgot to explain is that we're going to ask people multiple questions. Um, so we're going to ask them, we're going to give them three choices and then give them another three. Um, most conjoint surveys would have anywhere from 10 questions to, I've worked with ones with up to 50 questions. Um, so the respondents are going to answer a lot of questions um, repeatedly. And uh, often if, you're, if some of these products are new products that you're considering developing or new features that you're considering developing, then um, you're not going to have a lot of real-world data is sort of the practical concern. 
Um, but like we were talking about before, the 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 share when people are able to compare um, the share predictions from a choice model that was based on a survey to um, real shares in the real world, so long as um, there isn't a limit on how many products are allowed to be sold, often those will will match pretty closely. Um, but in in at least half the applications I've ever worked on, it wasn't even possible because some of the survey features were things that uh, weren't didn't exist in the marketplace yet. Yeah, that's a uh, yeah. I um, I agree with that. As a technical matter, something that's often done in the surveys is to look at kind of consistency of prediction within the survey. So if you estimate a model from some of the questions and then predict how you think they should answer to you know one or more of the other questions, you can look at that sort of uh, predictive validity within survey. Uh, a key limitation to that is that at the individual level, uh, there's a lot of noise in the estimates. And so um, because you just don't have enough data to estimate extremely reliably for one individual, and people may answer inconsistently from time to time. So, opt so I would suggest if you look at that sort of thing to look at it at an aggregate level. But it, you know, I've done a lot of choice surveys where people came into a physical um, building to look at prototypes and then answer these types of questions so that they could see what the, the new features were. And just anecdotally, when people are sitting there answering the questions, they sit very diligently and they think really, it's, it's kind of shocking. Like uh, these ones I've worked on that have a large number of questions where people are in a physical site, they will sit and their, their brow is wrinkled and they're thinking and they take a while to, to make each decision. Um, it, it's shocking how, um, how much people will put into it, and I think it's because it's an engaging exercise. It's like buying something, and that's something people, you know, enjoy doing. That that brings up one of my, fa in fact, I had a discussion just this morning about this topic. That I am a huge fan of mixing this sort of choice model exercise in with qualitative research. Uh, for exactly that reason and what I find is that people find it an engaging task if you're doing say focus groups and and you're talking about a product um, that's a good opportunity to, to do um, a survey of this kind in the middle of it it helps to break up the task you get some interesting data um, and and then you can oftentimes go back and talk to people about why they made the choices so it helps to diversify the task and collect uh, data you otherwise wouldn't get in a qualitative setting and um, and then to discuss that integration of why they made the decisions they made with the data you have. Oh, one more question here. Is there any model in the book that can be used to do supply and demand planning? Supply and demand planning. So that's not really a marketing problem. That's more of an operational problem. Huh. Um, so, uh, and demand forecasting is a big and sort of tricky area. Um, it often uses time series methods, which we, um, am I allowed to tell a story about how we decided not to include the time series methods, Chris? Um, yeah, I, I think so, yeah, sure. I don't know what the story so, is, so yes. To be honest, this is this will give you some insight into what it's like to be a book author. So um, after we'd been working on the book for maybe nine months, um, and almost all of it was written, we sort of sat back and looked at the table of contents and thought, is there anything we're missing? And I said, I think we're missing time series methods. <laughs> and then we thought for a little bit about whether we should write a chapter on time series methods, and we decided against it. And one reason was that we were uh, tired. Um, <laughs> but the other reason is that time series methods um, require you to learn how to use uh, the time objects in R, which are a little bit fussy. And so we decided that was kind of a topic that was really too specialized for, for this and, um, you know, not, not used by marketers that much. Uh, so um, to answer your question, to get back to your question, um, demand forecasting uh, is usually done with time series methods. I'm not sure what kind of uh, manufacturing application you're, you're thinking about, but that's often what people do in that space. And so you, 
you know, I'm sorry we didn't cover that. Do you do you have a more satisfying answer to that, Chris? No, I think that's it. And yeah, the other thing I'd say of time series is that uh, when we were thinking about them, we thought they would exceed our ability to put them in the book. That we'd need something like 100 to 200 pages to do them justice. Um, and you know, for anything other than toy problems, and so um, so we left it out. And do you have any situation that you find analytics don't work? <laughs> uh, well, I, I your screen share for a minute, Chris. I want to see your face. Yeah. Um. Well. Yes. Ab absolutely. So. Um, you know, but uh, dealing with teenagers, so. Um. <laughs> I don't have a better answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, um, you know, I think one of the, I guess one thing that I would say in bringing it back to, you know, to the sort of the application of these methods is that um, a key thing, and, and we, you know, this was, um, I, I think one of the goals of the book, we don't talk about it a lot in the book, but one of our goals was to try to make the methods uh, actionable and to focus on the business questions and the actual business decisions that would be made with any of these models. And a key thing, I think, in any applied business setting is to communicate these things to stakeholders in a way that uh, has a positive outcome and where they understand it um, and they're not simply snowed by technical details. Um, and so finding a way to take, you know, often very complex models to present them in a very simple and clear way and to be able to make that convincing. Um, we tried in our examples to, to model some of that a sort of way of presenting to stakeholders um, in the book, but I think that's a, that's a crucial skill that uh, in learning, and that's something that the analytics themselves don't help with. Yeah, I'd also add to that that the, the other place where it can really um, not work well is if the data doesn't support the analysis that you want to do. So I'll give you a concrete example of that. Um, I work with an engineer at Carnegie Mellon who really wanted to understand how people in China felt about different types of engines, um, hybrid engines, gas engines, and so, you know, the, a, a slew of different technologies. Um, and so I asked him, well, what are the market shares for those products in China? And it was all very small. So there were, you know, a small percentage of cars were being sold with hybrid engines. There were none that were full plug-in electric vehicle, you know, very small percentage that were full uh, plug-in electric vehicles. And, and when you have transaction data like that, um, you just can't determine, uh, there's just not sufficient data to determine how people are, um, how people would trade off between these different types of engines because clearly there's just, some of them don't really exist in the market or, or exist in such small numbers that we can't use them for statistical analysis. It's not enough for statistical analysis. And so uh, in that case, it's really um, valuable to think about, you know, what other data you might get, and surveys become a great option in that in that case. And I think Chris and I have both done a lot of work with survey research, you know, for exactly that reason. If you collect exactly the data that you need for the analysis that you intend to do, um, the analytics goes a lot smoother than if someone throws a transaction database at you and says, here, find something useful in this. That's a much harder task than sort of setting out to get exactly the data you need to, to do the analysis and to answer the business question that's being asked. So I'm going to move just to, to make sure we don't run out of time to a couple of the pointers here and that folks can go. You can, you know, we're easy to, to Google. Uh, there's a, a web page uh, for the, the book that, that I show here. And on that site for the book, um, there's links to all the code from the book. Um, and the data sets uh, that we use in the book. And uh, for anyone who's, um, you know, teaching, perhaps there are classroom slides that follow along the book. Uh, the book still needed to sort of explain the format of the data and what the models do and provide all the, the sort of educational part. Um, but we have a lot of these uh, 
um, you know, materials available out there. So you can go and, and check those out and, and have that kind of reference. And also you can find us um, you know, online and connect to us on LinkedIn or Twitter or, or whatever you prefer. And I think one last question. Um, have you done any open-end question study? Oh, so like text mining? Yes. Um, mm. Yes, we don't talk about that in the book. Um, generally, I think what I would say is that it's very, very difficult uh, to do sentiment analysis and uh, and text mining, uh, but it's it's highly domain specific. So if you're, you know, looking at uh, I don't know, you know, social media postings or something like that in in a domain where perhaps um, you know there's a lot of technical discussion and a lot of experts discussing, then it may be relatively easy to separate out, say, the products that they're talking about or something. But in many consumer areas, it's often difficult to tell in an automated way exactly what they're talking about, and it's also difficult uh, to attribute sentiment. So, um, so I think that's a tough area. What I've done in that space has been largely um, around uh, generative research, meaning just forming hypotheses, seeing what people are talking about, using it to spur ideas for research, rather than uh, you know, trying to use it as an evaluation or in, or a specific outcome metric. So that's been my experience. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, do you have thoughts about that, Ellie? So. Um. So there's a couple of nice applications. One that ties to what what we do in the book is um, if you use principal components analysis mm -hmm. on. Um, pairs of brands that occur together in that kind of open text. Um, I've seen that be extremely effective mm. at identifying kind of market structure issues, what kinds of products tend to be spoken about to, at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I've seen that be very effective, but no, I'd agree that more, more generally, like for instance, trying to text mine what people are saying in customer satisfaction logs is a, a tricky problem uh, and very domain specific. Any other questions, Hui? Um, let me check. Oh, one more. Uh, how often do you use those higher level models? I guess that means linear model is not higher level models. Oh, like the hierarchical models? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. More um, difficult model, is that often or just in some cases? I never see a model that isn't like that. <laughs> I always do that. <laughs> yeah, you, you basically... Um, Whenever you have repeated measures. Yeah. Yeah, or, or if you have a grouping variable. I mean, there's something like, uh, you know, Gelman, uh, Andy Gelman and, and Jennifer Hill's book, um, you know, shows how you can use hierarchical models to group by region or state or, you know, gender or whatever it is. Um, yeah, I, uh, my feeling about hierarchical models is that you get them almost for free, and so you might as well use them. And, and in fact, much of our orientation of the book kind of talks about that. Look how easy it is now to apply the hierarchical model, and you get this additional individual level or group level detail. And so I'm uh, a big proponent of them. Uh, the one time, you know, one time when they uh, can pose problems is if Sometimes they take a very long time to run, or you run into issues where the model won't converge for one reason or another, um, and then um, you know then you can reduce the number of levels or or back out to a purely aggregate model. But in in but general, cool. general if you have enough data, they're they're sort of you know for free plus you get more insight. You get to give you. A specific example of the kind of insight you get, and we actually, um, this is an illustration in the book. Um, in, in that synthetic data set, there are some people that really do want eight, eight um, seats and some people that really prefer six. Um, and so there's a dichotomy there, and a regular regression won't pick that up, but if you use a hierarchical regression or a hierarchical choice model, 
Um, and then you, you kind of do something like plot a histogram of the preference for eight seats over six. You'll see right away that, oh, there's a chunk of people here who really do prefer eight. And that can lead you to, to say, oh, well, we really should offer too many vans, one with six and one with eight, because there's two different groups of customers here. So it can really change decision making radically. Whereas the aggregate model would say there's no preference between on there they average out to the same, but in fact, you may have 50-50 strong preferences that just happen to, to average out. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. I think we are getting to the end. Thanks very much for having us, Hui. Well, thank you. These have been really great questions too, from uh, you know from you and and from the audience. So appreciate having that opportunity. Yep. Thank you for talking to us. Right. Yeah. Good night. Great. Good evening. Bye. Bye.